Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for attending uh, this webinar. Uh, I know you all have uh, very busy agendas, but um, we'll try to spend an hour together uh, talking about um, uh, EVAR, uh, hybrid rooms, uh, how to reduce radiation, and uh, a dedicated workflow to, to perform uh, complex endovascular procedures. So for those of you uh, who don't know me, I'm a vascular surgeon uh, in France, in uh, Lille, currently, soon uh, moving to Paris. I, uh, um, my name is uh, Stéphane Hollande. Uh, I was involved uh, very soon uh, with GE uh, in um, the development of the discovery. We were uh, fortunate to have the, the first uh, discovery room uh, global. Um, and so we have quite a, a large experience because we perform approximately uh, 250 endovascular repair a year uh, in the hybrid room in Lille, including uh, 80 uh, fenestrated and, and branch um, um, to, uh, to fix um, various complex disease such as uh, arch aneurysms, um, thoracoptomal aneurysms, uh, chronic dissections. So I'm going to try and explain uh, with all those slides how uh, such a dedicated uh, workflow and imaging system can uh, help you to be a very accurate, uh, very safe, and um, without uh, involving too much uh, radiation. So let's start uh, uh, the, uh, the PowerPoint. Uh, and uh, also, yeah, I wanted to uh, uh, tell you that uh, you can ask questions. You have this uh, Q&R um, uh, module uh, that you can actually click on and, and send me questions. So at the end of uh, the PowerPoint, uh, we can actually uh, exchange and uh, be very happy to answer any questions. Uh, nothing personal, but anything on the machine, I'll be very happy. There we are. Uh, okay. so. If we um, look at the, the whole process of uh, treating a patient with an endovascular approach, it involves uh, three uh, steps. Uh, first, uh, the planning, which is usually performed a couple of weeks before the procedure, especially when you uh, perform complex repair with fenestrate and branch endograft, because just manufacturing the endograft will require uh, four to six weeks. So during the planning process, uh, we're going to select the proper patients. Uh, we're going to size uh, the endograft. I try to, to design custom-made design that perfectly match to the patient's anatomy. So I need to, to spend quite a time on the 3D workstation uh, and perform a thorough analysis of the pre-op imaging uh, to make sure that uh, I can design a graph that will perfectly uh, match the patient's anatomy. And during the same process, uh, we are actually going to prepare the, the procedure uh, positioning landmarks uh, on the various fusion masks and work on a couple of fusion masks that I'm going to use uh, uh, during the procedure. Then uh, the day of the procedure, all the data that I have um, stored uh, when I was doing the, the, the planning process, uh, I can recall it uh, from, from table side. And uh, once the, the registration has been performed, uh, it's actually uh, quite nice to have um, all the, the, all the markers you'll see uh, available to, to show me where uh, will be the proximal landing zone of my endograft, uh, to tell me the, the origin of each target vessel. And uh, this will help me to be you know, much more accurate. And, uh, to, uh, and also at the end of the procedure, uh, we will um, assess technical success not only by performing a, an AP angel, but by doing a 3D imaging with a Combium CT. And you'll see that it's it's routine uh, for every uh, EVAR, FIVAR, BVAR. Uh, we will perform um, it's a, a 3D rotation, a 3D angel to to be able to to make sure that we have obtained technical success. And if not, uh, we can fix it right away uh, prior to discharging the patient from the hybrid room. Now, before the procedure, so let's talk more specifically uh, on the uh, the planning uh, process. And uh, first, you need to select uh, uh, the right patient, uh, obviously, when you're, you're using an endovascular approach. And you can always push the envelope, uh, especially if um, you have a, quite a high experience in, in a high volume center. But those are the kind of um, patients that uh, you might want to avoid at the beginning of your, of your experience uh, during the learning curve. Uh, those patients with a very angulated uh, aortic uh, and iliac anatomy. Uh, patient uh, with challenging access. You can see here, uh, this patient has uh, an occluded uh, left um, iliac axis and uh, also patients with a, a shaggy aortic wall. 
uh, because uh, it can uh, lead to uh, cholesterol emboli in the visceral artery, in the renal arteries, uh, to the uh, the lower limbs. So this can lead to a catastrophe. So spending a, a, a lot of time on the um, on the on the workstation to, to perfectly select the patient, I think, is uh, is uh, is mandatory. Now, if I speak. So what are we going to to do when we um, do the sizing, we are going to spend some time to, to, to measure the various length uh, diameters of the aorta to position, uh, to select the proper proximal and distal landing zone. Uh, we're uh, pretty aggressive in making sure that uh, we select a healthy uh, aorta above and, and, and below uh, the, uh, the aneurysm to, to get a, a good uh, seal and fixation. And, and we always think that any uh, endovascular repair uh, can fail in the long run, so we always design an endograft uh, that can be fixed uh, in the future with a proximal or, or distal uh, extension. Then after having uh, performed the sizing process, uh, we will uh, position the various uh, landmarks and we're going to store uh, the various uh, best working position to access uh, each uh, target vessel. For example, if we do a fenestrator branch to access the, the visceral and renals, or for a regular uh, endograft, we will store the best working position to uh, get the graft just below the renal arteries and then the best working position uh, to locate the origin of the internal iliac on the right side and, and uh, on the left side. And then the, um, the process will end by looking at the various uh, masks. Uh, so the, to register your fusion, you need a, a very um, nice um, uh, bone uh, mask. So you can see here a 3D VR mask that you can edit and also various 3D VR mask of the outer and its branches that you can uh, you can also uh, edit. Now you can see uh, the, the sizing process uh, starts by a, just a, a simple uh, click and then the AW will automatically um, process uh, this type of image with um, a vessel automatic uh, vessel extraction and segmentation. You have a various um, center lines of our position you can add or delete center lines and uh, you can get uh, on the stretch view uh, a very accurate measurements of the various length and uh, the various uh, diameters to design your endograft there are a couple of very interesting uh, uh, tools on that um, that software uh, one is that you have uh, small arrows that are located at the level of each origin of uh, target vessel or each uh, bifurcation uh, you have an automatic positioning of the origin of the target vessel. You see here on, on the right renal, by just clicking on the origin of the right renal, you automatically get the, the clock position of this target vessel. So there's a, a couple of very interesting features um, because this uh, software is really dedicated to, to, to endograft planning. So we've made the whole workflow uh, very user-friendly. Uh, um, I think this is a, a very important. And then the next step, once you've sized the, the endograft, is uh, to position the various landmarks. And you can see here uh, on the, the left side, uh, the, um, the, the, the most proximal circle, blue circle in, in the alta, is then the top of the, the stand graft. And then you can see uh, the origin of uh, the visceral vessel and the renal uh, arteries. And you can see the, the contour uh, of the, and the aortic lumen and of the, the renal arteries on, on this AP view. And um, again, we're going to store uh, all the, uh, the various working positions. So you have preset working position like a proximal seal or, or a um, distal seal, but you can add or in any position, I mean, uh, as many positions as you want that you can recall from a table side the day of the procedure. But just by recalling um, one position, the gantry will automatically uh, get to, to this best working position. So that's a, a very a useful. Uh, when you're performing the case. And again, at the end of the process, when you're uh, preparing the, um, the various fusion masks, uh, you have a bone model that has been uh, automatically um, extracted by, by the system that you can uh, edit, you can you know, remove or, or delete whatever you want. And it's the same for the 3D VR arterial model. You can see that uh, the first one has uh, all the branches uh, with also the division branches of the, uh, the various visceral vessel. And you can see that next to it, you have the mini aorta view uh, that is uh, actually uh, will only generate the origin of uh, the various branches uh, of the aorta. And again, uh, if you're not happy with this uh, automatic um, fusion mask, you can delete or, or, or add any um, 
branch, division branch, uh, or uh, any part of the, uh, the alpha that, that, that's missing uh, at this stage. So everything is actually automatic, but everything uh, can be edited uh, at every step. Now I'm going to show you um, a, a video uh, that is actually summarizes a, a bit uh, what we've been uh, talking about for the last uh, 10 minutes. To prepare for this patient and to check uh, for the various uh, center lines that um, the 3D workstation will automatically generate. I can actually edit the center line to perfectly design an endograph that will match the patient's anatomy. I need to nicely uh, localize the various target vessel uh, that will require fenestration. The system automatically locates the origin of the target vessel with those uh, yellow arrows. And so I can actually position this ruler and then automatically I will know the distance. And also, using this clock position tool, I can locate the origin of each target vessel. I actually have very quickly, very easily, all the information required to design this fenestrated endograph. And you can see that we have the origin of each target vessel um, that is nicely visualized uh, by a, a circle. Then I can find the best working position to access uh, this target vessel. And I can also position uh, landing uh, positions for my endograph, proximal distal landing position. The final step is to prepare uh, the fusion mask for the procedure. So day of the procedure, I will just select uh, the patient's uh, data, all the information required uh, for the, the fusion model and all the working position that I have actually uh, pre-selected while doing the, the, the planning of the endograph and the planning of um, the, the fusion uh, registration. Registration. There you are. So again, I want to emphasize that it's a very easy uh, process and it's a step-by-step -step, uh, process and the learning curve with this, um, this whole software, with this uh, planning and, and guiding tool is, uh, is very fast and we want it to be uh, intuitive and really dedicated to, to vascular surgeon and uh, all the endovascular therapists uh, performing um, uh, our tech and the graphing. And uh, I'm really a true believer in um, a workflow for dummies. And usually what I say is uh, even a vascular surgeon can use it and I'm a vascular surgeon. So I think it's, uh, um, that's the main reason why I, I love uh, uh, this system. Now we're going to switch uh, from the pre-op uh, process session that was performed a couple of weeks before the procedure to the day of the procedure. And uh, now we're going to talk about uh, how we are going to register uh, the fusion model uh, the day of the procedure. And uh, again, it's, it's quite a, a simple and swift process. And you can see uh, on the video here that uh, we're going to do a, a by view registration, meaning that we're going to shoot an AP um, a fluoro and then, and then move uh, the, the, the C arm uh, lateral until the system uh, informs you that you will have 100% accuracy. Uh, usually how we do it at uh, in my center is we tend to do uh, um, AP and lateral views because the lateral view is, is actually very interesting to, 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 to nicely uh, position uh, the image from this, the, the pre-op CT of the spine on top of the image of the spine from the, the, uh, the floor shot. And you can see that rather than um, using a 3D VR reconstruction of um, the uh, the bone uh, from the pre-op CT, we use a DDR uh, reconstruction, which is a specific mode that is uh, interesting because it, it really almost perfectly matches the image from the uh, the floor uh, shot that uh, you, you had performed. I think we have, next we have uh, to the patient's to body. The, the, registration. the first step of the procedure uh, is going to register the pre-op CT on top of the fluoro image uh, to use the, the fusion application. So I'm going to first shoot an AP fluoro that I'm going to store. I'm going to switch uh, to a lateral view and I'm going to again shoot a simple single fluoro shot and then uh, save it. Now I'm in the by view mode and I can do translation, do rotation. So once I'm happy, I just validate uh, my registration from table side and I switch from uh, the bone mask to uh, the arterial mask. And you can see the origin of uh, all target vessel are nicely visualized and also the landing zone of my... Uh... So I agree with what the guy says on the video. 
uh, and um, I just wanted to, to, to again um, emphasize that everything is performed uh, from, from table side and that uh, the registration is performed uh, by a translation and also by a rotation uh, because you have to realize that the position of the patient on the table of the hybrid room is not the same as the position uh, of the patient uh, on the, uh, the CT um, table. Now, you also have to realize that you cannot have a 100% accurate uh, registration for, for many reasons. One is uh, what I was just quoting is the position of the patient on the, uh, on the table. Uh, the, uh, the other one is uh, because we're going to insert inside uh, the aortic uh, lumen, we're going to insert stiff wires and a stiff delivery system uh, on top of the stiff wires. So the idea is to have a, quite a, a fast registration, even if it's not 100% accurate, using uh, very low uh, radiation dose and, and, uh, and being able to perform it in a couple of minutes. And then once you really need to be 100% accurate, uh, accurate, 100 accurate, then we're going to do a fine uh, tuning uh, of the registration, meaning that we're going to do a very small floor um, BSA shot, sorry, with a very uh, low volume of contrast. Usually we use a seven or seven and a half cc's of contrast at very high rate. And then we're going to make sure that um, the uh, fusion mask uh, matches uh, the image uh, of um, and the all time is branches on the, the DSA uh, one. So I think this is probably what we're going to see on the next video. Inside the Alta, we have slightly changed the anatomy. So we're going to do a very short DSA run. And from table side, I'm going to fine tune my fusion mask. And this actually looks pretty good now. And you see that uh, once I have uh, fine-tuned the, uh, the registration mask, I actually can trust uh, my fusion mask and I can open a fenestrate and endograft here with a full vessel fenestrate and endograft uh, just by looking at uh, the, uh, the fusion mask and uh, all the uh, origin of target vessel that are really clearly visualized. So before I was doing a, a lot of uh, consecutive um, DSA runs just to make sure that it was not too high or too low. Now I have uh, really uh, all the information uh, that is required to, to open safely at the endograft. Now, also what's going to happen once I open the endograft, um, for example, if my renal artery is at a three o'clock or nine o'clock, I'll be in a perfect position uh, to, um, to accurately um, deploy my endograft. And, and because uh, the two lateral markers of um, each uh, renal fenestration will be facing each other, and the origin of each target vessel uh, on the DSA run will be exactly what I'm seeing um, uh, by just looking at the DSA loop. Uh, whereas um, if those vessel origin are located quite anterior on the alta, for example, 10 o'clock for the right renal, uh, I might need to, to, to get some uh, rotation of the gantry to, if it's 10 o'clock, then this will be 30 degree uh, rotation uh, RAO or LAO, sorry. Um, and then to have the two lateral markers facing each other. And uh, if I struggle to get access to the renal, I can shoot a new angel and just make sure that my registration is, is really accurate. Uh, now, those are a couple of tips and tricks. Here you can see on the right, this was actually before having access uh, to the hybrid room and, uh, and working with a fusion. You see, I have the tip of my catheter uh, through the right renal uh, fenestration, and I'm injecting a little bit of, of, of contrast. You can see uh, the arrow is a bit uh, offset, but it's, you can see that uh, the, I'm injecting a little bit of contrast in the right renal, so I know that if I push my wire, I, I would get in, into the right renal artery. And on the other side, on the left side, I have preposition a catheter inside the left renal artery because at that time I didn't have a, a fusion, couldn't use fusion routinely, so it was kind of the poor man fusion. I was positioning wires and catheters in the target vessel to have a fixed marker and to perform those procedures. So you see how helpful it is to, to, to have the fusion because I don't need to do all those steps uh, uh, anymore. Uh, this is a couple of, uh, of tips and tricks to perform those procedures because uh, getting access uh, through uh, fenestration to a target vessel and then pushing a catheter uh, is not always easy. So uh, one um, trick is to use uh, the top of the fabric because at this stage, um, before releasing the top stent, we have uh, we can get support from above. So I get um, you know glide catheters to to track all the way to the top and then down into the target vessel because. Sometimes those target vessels are really looking um, 
down the south and uh, not that easy to uh, uh, to get it to rise. Now this is uh, something else so also you have to have in mind is that uh, your endograft uh, will be released but it has diameter reducing ties. So this is how your endograft is uh, designed and you can see the fenestration origin, uh, the fenestration that are matching the origin of, of its target vessel. But in reality, when you're unsheathing the undergraft, because of the diameter reducing ties, you can see that the uh, the origin of the fenestration is slightly offset backward. Those are images from uh, Gustavo Odrich from the, the Mayo Clinic, and they're very interesting because they, they show you that you might need during the procedure to, to rotate your graft uh, clockwise or anti-clockwise to perfectly match the origin of the target vessel with the, with the fenestration and to help you access um, those uh, those target vessels. So this is for the right renal and this is for uh, the left uh, renal. A couple of uh, other issues that can, that can happen. Uh, again, nice drawings from the, uh, the Mayo Clinic from, uh, from Gustavo. And you can see that when you capture the, the nose cone of your delivery system, you can have a, a conflict uh, with the bridging stent in the renal artery protruding in the aortic lumen. And that's why we'll come back to that later on. You can actually kink uh, one of the uh, uh, of the bridging stent that you've positioned through through a fenestration. Um, another uh, issue can be uh, a kink between a stiff uh, bridging stent here in the right renal artery and uh, the target vessel, S specifically on the right renal artery, uh, because this uh, target vessel tends to go very backward be behind the the IVC. So that's why you need 3D imaging at the end of the procedure because if you have uh, such um, uh, such an anatomy at the end of the procedure is a high risk of uh, uh, this uh, right renal artery uh, occluding uh, during an early follow-up. So that's why you need to realign this uh, with the self-expandable stent to have a, a smooth transition between the stiff bridging stent and the, the target vessel. So again, emphasize uh, uh, the need for 3D imaging at the end of the procedure. Now, um, endograft deployment with image fusion, used for fusion, uh, mask, for table, and CM positioning, landmarks, and automatic recall of working angles. So this is uh, something that we'll see uh, on the video now. So now I'm gonna start working on the right renal uh, fenestration, and you can see how accurate uh, the fusion mask uh, and the markers of the origin of the target vessel are, and how they were helpful to get access to this right renal artery. Uh, we're going to use now the digital zoom, and this is virtual magnification, so it doesn't increase um, uh, the radiation. And was very useful because I could clearly see the tip of my catheter and position it in the direction of uh, my vessel. We are going to position the gantry and table in the preset SMA position. Okay. We have the, the four target vessels that have been catheterized through their respective fenestrations. You're going to see the endograph will pop open from top to bottom. We're inflating the right renal stent. We're inflating the right renal stent. I just did a, a fluoro run to check a, a the patency uh, check of my target vessel to check that it was uh, um, that it had a good seal, um, and no dissection. So I'm seal. very happy no with the results. Now we're working on the left renal bridging stent, and I think again it's a good result. We have a good seal, good patency. A good seal, good patency. So I think it's, it's very interesting on this video to see um, how proactive we are with the fusion and how it, it is useful. So I'm always positioning um, my table and gantry without doing any fluoro. And uh, when I press on the pedal, I know exactly what I'm gonna see. Um, I'm using the digital uh, magnification, uh, digital zoom, which actually is not a real magnification. It doesn't require 
uh, extra uh, radiation. And on top of that, uh, I'm doing a lot of uh, collimation. So this is actually um, something you can do when uh, you're using infusion. So that's why you should use fusion routinely, even if you do a, a regular uh, uh, EVAR. And um, also you, you, you saw that I am most of the time try to do four loops rather than DSA runs to, again, keep the, uh, the radiation dose uh, as low uh, as possible. Now, at the end of the procedure, when we're uh, done with the, uh, uh, with the positioning of the, the undergraft, the bridging stent, and the distal bifurcated component, um, again, I think it's mandatory to, to perform a, a 3D assessment of um, your repair. Uh, in order to make sure that uh, there's uh, no technical uh, failure. And uh, so this is how we do it. And it's, again, routine. And uh, again, I want to emphasize that it's, it's everyday practice. I I'm not showing you um, Combeam CT uh, uh, that we're, we've used once every other month uh, for a complex case. It's for every regular EVAR, eyelid branch, uh, fenestrated. Uh, we will use it routinely and you will see how easy it is to, to perform because of the, the specific uh, whiteboard configuration. And in a couple of seconds after this uh, 360 rotation, uh, we will have uh, the AW that will generate uh, various um, uh, NPR, uh, 3D emit, 3D uh, VR uh, reconstruction uh, so that we can make sure that uh, we have uh, completely excluded the, the aneurysm. And if we're using a fenestrate in the graph to make sure there's no kink or, or, or no um, issues with the, with the bridging stents. So you can see here uh, on the video. So we're getting ready for the, uh, the Combeam uh, CT. From table side, I want to be in a 3D CT mode. The gantry uh, can uh, nicely rotate uh, around the patient because of the specific wide bore configuration of the uh, IGS 730. From table side, we can check the result of this uh, Combeam CT. The renal stents are nicely open, and there's really no contrast in the sac. So uh, I'm very happy. I'm very happy with the, the result. So a couple of uh, interesting points here. Um, you see how easy it is to perform. I don't have a radio tech uh, radiologist working with me. Uh, it's not that I don't want one. It's just we, we can't afford anymore in, in, in our system to, to have a, a tech 24-7 with us. So I can actually uh, perform a Combeam CT, uh, again, monitoring everything for, from, from table side. Um, also, I think it's very interesting to see that uh, we have a, a perfect position of the table uh, and the gantry, because when I'm doing the um, a first uh, rotation, I'm checking with the fusion mask that uh, my, the alpha is always in the middle uh, of the image. So I think that's, a, that's quite an interesting point. That's another reason for using fusion routinely is that when you use a Combeam CT, you make sure that your acquisition will have uh, uh, the outer uh, well, uh, position in the middle. Now, this is an example of uh, what can happen or what you can see uh, on the, uh, the Combeam CT at the end of a fenestrated uh, procedure. So this patient had been uh, treated with a, a graft with a branch for the CDEC trunk and uh, three fenestrations for the SMA and both renals. Um, he had a borderline renal function, so the uh, Combeam CT was performed with no uh, contrast. And uh, those are the various uh, uh, reconstructions. And if I look at the uh, just the NPR axial reconstruction, you can see that the uh, SMA bridging stent looks uh, very nice. The right renal bridging stent looks uh, very nice, but the uh, left renal stent is crushed. Um, and actually, on the uh, selective AP angel, it, it looked nice, uh, but uh, it is actually crushed. And if I hadn't fixed that. Uh, uh, that left renal stent, it would have occluded very soon after the procedure. So um, doing the same uh, procedure uh, from the axial axis that uh, was used to put the branch in the CDEC trunk, we uh, gain access again uh, through this kinked uh, left renal artery, left renal stent, sorry. And this was um, not that easy. You can see that I'm struggling to, to advance my wire into the left renal artery. But once uh, we were uh, inside the phenol artery, we, we exchanged uh, the floppy wire for a stiffer one, a rosin, and then we flared again uh, from the axial approach once again at the, uh, the renal stand. So we fixed this technical uh, issue. Uh, this patient uh, previously would have been discharged from the hybrid room, uh, would have uh, spent a couple of days in the ICU, then would have had his uh, post op CT, and unfortunately would probably have a, an occluded left phenol artery or would have uh, required a, 
uh, a new trip to the uh, to the hydrogen to fix this uh, Neptune launch bit. So again, it's it's uh, uh, very interesting to to have this uh, uh, Combium CT uh, performed at the end of the procedure. Now, uh, sometimes it's just not possible to get access again uh, to the kinked renal stent. You can see here that uh, the kink is really severe on this uh, left renal stent, and I never managed from the aortic lumen to get access back uh, to the uh, left renal stent and left renal artery. So we used a, another uh, application that is available uh, on the uh, on the discovery. It's called needle assist. It's actually the uh, um, application we uh, use uh, to perform type two endoleak translumbar embolization. And so with this uh, needle assist application, uh, we got a, uh, a trajectory, a needle trajectory uh, from the back of the patient to uh, the left renal artery. And you can see that I'm uh, getting one of those sort of long needles in the back of the patient. And then the, the target uh, was just distal to the left renal artery. And you see the, 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 the view uh, of um, the uh, the, the best working position to, to, to access uh, this uh, left renal artery. And then uh, we managed uh, to push a wire back into the aortic lumen, uh, snared it from a groin approach. And finally, we had a, a through and through wire uh, coming out of the back of the patient and uh, on the groin on the other side. And through this through and through wire, we managed to access again this renal artery, uh, re um, uh, flared it, and we actually relined uh, the distal end of the. Uh, of the renal stent with another uh, covered stent um, to cover the puncture site of the renal artery just to make sure there was no uh, bleeding after the procedure and the, the patient uh, did fine. So uh, this is show you that uh, we're using every advanced imaging application uh, available uh, on the machine and that uh, it's actually uh, safe and to be able to, to, to do that. Now, obviously, there's a concern when you're performing those uh, complex procedures uh, that uh, you and the patient uh, might be exposed to uh, to high level of uh, radiation. So there's a couple of things uh, you need to do, and some are um, in connection with your uh, system, and other are in connection with the LRO principle, and, and you need to be aware of, of all that. We actually monitored uh, our practice, and specifically after performing the first uh, 100 cases under fusion guidance, we looked at our uh, median uh, DAP doing either um, regular EVAR on the left side or complex uh, cases uh, on the right side, and we compared our results to literature and also compared uh, to our previous experience uh, using a mobile CR. And we were very surprised to see that we we really uh, reduced significantly uh, our, our those, uh, uh, exposure. And I'll show you uh, why is that. And uh, we also monitored uh, our dose uh, exposure over the lead apron, and uh, the results were quite astonishing uh, because uh, I, I'm a bit really, I'm focused, I'm maniac about uh, radiation protection. You can see that uh, it, it has an impact on, on your uh, exposure every day. And you see that uh, uh, our results uh, are far, far from uh, the, the limit uh, exposed. Um, the uh, the limit exposure suggested by the ICRP. We can perform a 2,000 uh, fenestrated branch endograft a year uh, prior to reaching this, this limit. So it's, it's quite safe uh, currently. So what are the interesting features of, of your imaging system that will lower the radiation exposure? Well, first, uh, you need to, to work with the last generation system uh, that has um, a flat panel and an uh, auto exposure loop. So this is, uh, has to do only with, with your system. There's nothing you can do about it. Uh, what uh, you can do uh, is actually making sure that uh, you protect yourself. You have a, a lead prongs and a shield above and below uh, the patient on both sides of the patient, because there's no reason that uh, the guy helping you on the other side uh, would get more exposed uh, uh, than you are. Uh, obviously, you need to step back when you, you do uh, uh, a DSA run. And every time you change your working position, make sure that uh, uh, everything, uh, all the shields, all the protections are back in, into the uh, into the right uh, position prior to, to doing any uh, X-ray. Now you need to optimize the system geometry, uh, meaning that you need to position uh, the table as high as possible and the flat panel as near as possible uh, to the patient. This is how you will reduce significantly uh, the air karma at the patient's skin, and also this is how you will reduce the scattered radiation for for you uh, and the team. And there's a, a way to actually uh, improve this um, uh, this uh, geometry it is by uh, using InnovaSense. And you can see that uh, when we're performing uh, cases uh, with the uh, with the IGS, 
Um, let me try and run this video again. So when we're performing uh, uh, those cases, the uh, automatically the flat panel positions uh, itself as near as possible to the uh, to the patient's body. So the video uh, is not running. So I just switch uh, to the next one, and you can see that it uh, really has a significant impact again on the air karma and uh, also on the on the scattered radiation. Um, there you are. Now, what you uh, need to do also when you start uh, a case uh, is to make sure that um, you set up uh, the system using the lowest uh, radiation uh, dose protocol um, that you need and with a, a low frame rate. So usually we, we start by this uh, low radiation dose uh, protocol and uh, with frame rate of 7.5 or 3.75. And if it's not enough, you can always you know, switch to a higher a radiation dose uh, protocol and then switch back when you don't need any more. But uh, in 90, 95% of cases, we just stay to this, uh, with this uh, low dose protocol. And actually you get used to having a slightly um, uh, different image, uh, but it has a, a huge impact on uh, your exposure to, 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 to radiation. Now, on top of that, using fusion routinely and not doing a 3D 3D registration, but a 2D 3D registration has a, a large impact. Uh, finding your working position without X-ray because uh, you're using fusion and also because you have preset those uh, best working position prior to, to getting scrub. And uh, using a digital zoom rather than real magnification and using a collimation has a, a lot of uh, a real impact. Um, this is just to show you that the, the field of view has a and um, true magnification has a, a very a large impact on the air camera and the scattered radiation. You can see from no mag to one mag or two mag uh, position uh, how the radiation significantly uh, increases. Um, you can see here that I'm using a lot of collimation um, and for a regular uh, EVAR case that uh, requires a DAP of, of 30 uh, by just routinely using a collimation and usually on average is 60% collimation you reduce uh, the DAP to 18 so almost by half and it's a one-to-one -one ratio so 60% collimated area is a 60% uh, dose state so you really have to be again very proactive and this is something that you can do for from table side and I think it's it's mandatory that you, you focus on, on performing as much collimation as possible. Now what uh, you need to do also is uh, I've already stated that is you need to, to limit uh, the DSA runs because uh, on average one DSA image is equivalent to 500 flow image. So whenever possible, uh, we uh, tend to prefer uh, performing uh, those uh, floral loops that give you uh, enough information. If you don't get information that you need, well then you can maybe do a DSA run. But routinely we try to to do almost only uh, uh, floral loops. Now you need to also focus on the uh, CR mangulation. Uh, you can see here. Uh, on this diagram that if you move to more than 30 degree LAO, RAO um, angulation or more than 15 degree uh, cranial caudal, you significantly uh, uh, increase uh, the radiation. So I I'm not telling you that you should never work in a lateral position. Uh, what I'm telling you is um, if you need to access the SMA, go into a lateral position, but once uh, you're done, just switch back to AP a a as soon as possible. And I think this is a a very important. Now you can see uh, here on this video again how uh, moving uh, the uh, CR lateral increases pretty significantly uh, the erythema patient uh, skin and the, uh, the scattered radiation. So again, a real concern uh, with uh, with angulation. Now I showed you um, the results of uh, our center. We, we've monitored um, our, our practice with, with those radiation and uh, there was a question mark regarding uh, is it something that we are, are those results just obtained at my center because we are really focused on the radiation uh, or can other centers equipped also with the discovery can get the similar results so we performed this uh, multi-centric um, trial that was a prospective trial uh, including patients from six centers uh, worldwide one in the US one in Japan uh, two uh, in England and uh, two in France. And each center had a, a specific uh, imaging training, uh, a webinar like today. And we also monitored um, their um, practice prior to uh, incorporating the first patient uh, in, in the study. And we used this uh, very interesting tool, this uh, DOSWatch 
tool that uh, really uh, provides very comprehensive, comprehensive uh, data. You can see that uh, on, on the dashboard uh, below, you can see uh, uh, the number of uh, DSA uh, runs that you perform uh, during a case, uh, the, the frame rate that uh, you're using here, 375 or 7.5, if you're using magnification or not, and if you're doing a lot of uh, angulated, um, if you get your uh, a lot of uh, angulated runs and uh, angulated uh, axis. Uh, and so for uh, one of the centers, for example, we, we monitored uh, uh, 10 cases and we saw that they had a DAP for regular EVA that was actually quite good, 37. But looking at the dashboard, we could see that they were not using collimation at all, uh, that uh, they were using magnification. Uh, despite uh, using uh, routine diffusion, by just telling them that they could collimate a little bit more and not do any more magnification, you can see that for the next uh, eight cases, uh, they reduced by half the, uh, their DAP. And you can see that now they, they did uh, uh, almost 75% of the procedure using collimation and they didn't use any more magnification anymore because they don't require it because uh, they use... Uh, uh, fusion routinely and so they can use the, the digital zoom. So very interesting to, to, to monitor and with this um, this, uh, this dashboard provided by those watch, uh, uh, it was very easy to, uh, to tell them how they could uh, improve uh, their practice. Now, uh, if we look at, at the, the whole um, hospital stay of, of the patient, uh, remember uh, now we're actually uh, doing a convium CT at the end of the procedure. And so this enables us to just perform the ultrasound a couple of days after the procedure and to discharge the patient. Whereas before we were uh, discharging patients uh, from the OR, then uh, um, getting him uh, back to the ward and, and performing a, a follow-up CTA prior to discharging the patient. Well, Convim CT plus uh, ultrasound compared to completion angio plus CTA uh, we compared uh, two cohorts of patients, and actually in those patients undergoing Convium CT, we had uh, less radiation during the hospital stay and, and less uh, contrast volume. So there's an another reason uh, for performing Convium CT at the end of the procedure is you can discharge uh, your patients much faster, and they're less exposed uh, to radiation and less exposed to renal failure because you, you need less uh, contrast to perform, uh, uh, to assess technical success uh, at the end of the procedure. So it's time to conclude. Uh, sorry for having been so long, but uh, I think now we have a very nice, uh, very swift uh, workflow with three key steps uh, for successful EVAR and, and more complex EVAR. We have the, 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 the pre-op process, including the planning um, of the, the device itself, but also the planning of the, the procedure with the fusion mask and the best working position and, and the various landmarks. Um, during the case, we uh, are um, now uh, using fusion for 100% of our cases. Uh, I could not perform a case without fusion anymore. And at the end of the procedure, we routinely perform a Convium CT to make sure that uh, we obtain technical success. And um, the whole process actually uh, has uh, reduced significantly the, uh, um, the radiation dose and um, the volume of contrast that we routinely use uh, to perform th those cases. And um, I think that it uh, also has a, an impact on the, your hospital, uh, on the, your patient hospital stay. And uh, this is something we really need to assess uh, very seriously because I think this uh, also has a, a, a con an economical impact because if you can uh, uh, discharge your patient uh, much faster, it has a real benefit for your institution. So I think that uh, we're done with this, um, uh, with this PowerPoint. Uh, there's going to be a lot of talks and a lot of discussion and uh, couple of uh, specific uh, symposium at Charing Cross uh, focusing on the discovery on those uh, uh, various uh, imaging application uh, workflows. So I'll be very happy to, um, the GE team and myself will be very happy to meet you at Charing Cross either on the booth or during one of those uh, symposium. And um, I think it's time now for a, a question. Uh, and please don't be shy, uh, send me many questions and you can challenge me. I'll be very happy to to answer. Thank you for your attention. So questions are arriving. A very interesting question. Um, the first question 
is about the Convim CT. What is the difference between performing Convim CT with or without contrast? Um, if you are performing Convim CT without contrast, you cannot um, depict uh, endoliques, uh, but what you can do is really very accurately assess um, all the, the bridging stents that are uh, positioned uh, through the penetration into the target vessel, making sure they're not kinked and that they're far enough into the target vessel to, to, to get a good seal. So if the patient has a borderline uh, renal function and you don't want to inject uh, much contrast because doing a contrast enhanced um, condom CT requires approximately 35 cc of contrast. So if the patient, if you don't want to do that, you might want to do uh, a first an angel, an AP angel with a very low dose of contrast, just using 12, 12 and a half cc's of contrast diluted with the same amount of uh, saline. So then with this simple angel, you will see if there's an endolic or not, and then the condom CT will show you all the metallic structure uh, of the um, of the uh, of your uh, repair of the bridging stand and the endograft. So we either perform a condom CT with contrast or a short angel run and a convenient CT without contrast in those patients with a renal function that is borderline. Now, another question. So how much contrast do you use for a convenient CT? So we, uh, our protocol is to use 35 cc uh, of uh, contrast diluted in 35 uh, cc of uh, saline. The, uh, we start the, uh, the rotation uh, three seconds after starting uh, the injection, and the injection is um, is uh, start, yeah, three second uh, delay uh, in injection. So the so total volume will be 70 cc's, half contrast, half saline. Now uh, I have other questions um, regarding the, uh, um, the learning curve uh, with this, um, uh, with the discovery, uh, with the, this workflow. And it's a very interesting question because uh, uh, when we started using uh, the, the discovery five years ago, the, the IFU was a, a 600 page book and uh, we were quite concerned about uh, the learning curve. But uh, rapidly, we, we, with the, uh, uh, the help of uh, the GE engineers that uh, spent some time with us, we, we managed to come up with a, a workflow dedicated to our practice. And then we actually came up with a specific uh, imaging application such as the one I've showed you today. And so. Uh, currently, uh, residents and fellows arriving in, in my department are fully trained with the system in less than a week. And, and again, uh, we have no radio tech, no radiologist, and we still manage to use all those advanced imaging application uh, every day. Obviously, this would be uh, much better with techs and, and radiologists, but uh, unfortunately, we, we, we don't have them. Now, a couple of other questions. How often do you use track vision for uh, endolic treatments? So it's now our routine way of uh, treating type 2 endoliques that are uh, fitted by uh, uh, lumbar arteries. So the way we looked at the type 2 endoleak, uh, first, uh, if the IMA is involved, we, we, rather, uh, we prefer to, to go transarterial into the I, uh, SMA first and all the way uh, to the IMA and then um, embolize the leak with uh, coils and, uh, and uh, onyx. Uh, but for all those endoliques that are uh, perfused by the lumbar arteries, we position um, uh, the, the patient uh, cone on the table, and, and then we directly go uh, with track vision for a translumbar function uh, directly into the angiosome sac. So we, we get those uh, long 18 gauge needles directly into the nidus, and then we in the in the needle we advance microcatheter. Uh, we first fill the endolique cavity uh, with a couple of coals to reduce the flow in the endolique. And then uh, we inject uh, quite a, a large amount of onyx to completely uh, exclude um, all uh, feeding vessel for, uh, of this uh, of this endoleak. Now a lot of questions are arriving here. Uh, is there any way to inject CO2 instead of contrast for renal impairment? Uh, did you try to inject CO2 through CBCT and segment the 3D data? The answer is, is no. Um, I think that if you want to use uh, CO2. Um, you really need to, to equip yourself with a specific uh, ancillary tool. Uh, we don't have it uh, in my institution. Actually, we don't have it anymore because since we've switched to uh, using the, the discovery, um, we've reduced so dramatically uh, the amount of contrast that uh, we need to perform those procedures that uh, I don't see the need for CO2 anymore. But um, obviously, uh, it would be interesting to, to, to do some work on the, 
on CO2 injection with a convinced CT, but I, I don't have that, that experience. And I'm not sure that um, I've seen anyone uh, performing convinced CT with CO2 yet, but we, we need to, to look at it. Another question. <laughs> That's not a question. Antonio is telling me, thank you for your presentation. My pleasure. Now, uh, another question. Do you use only Onyx? So we we don't uh, use Onyx only. Uh, we like uh, first that there's an issue with cost uh, because uh, Onyx uh, is very expensive, and if you want to completely fill a, an endolic cavity, then sometimes can be quite large. You need a lot of Onyx. So we 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 tend to to first fill most of the endolic cavity with a very long coils and and, and then use Onyx. So it's Onyx a plus uh, for us. Doesn't um, confuse me. That's a very interesting point uh, from Ant uh, Antonio from, uh, from Modena, uh, asking me uh, if when you do a, a contrast uh, convium CT, if there's no confusion uh, with the, uh, the contrast that is already uh, inside the, uh, the aneurysm sac um, that has been uh, trapped uh, during the, the procedure. So um, it's we, the, the contrast that is in, inside the sac uh, is not as bright as the contrast uh, from, from the injection. And usually you can uh, really easily see what is a uh, uh, trapped contrast and what is uh, from the, the recent injection. But it, it, it's a good question. You don't have the dynamic uh, vision of, uh, the, um, of the regular angel. Having said that, you can look at the 3D uh, rotation with the, the injection, and this can give you uh, interesting uh, information. Uh, but so far, we have been able to, to depict uh, type 1B uh, endoleaks. And actually, I think that we're depicting too much 1B endoleaks. Most of those endoleaks uh, that we were not seeing previously by doing an AP angio were, you know, uh, just behind um, the limbs. And so we've uh, reballoned a lot of those limbs that uh, probably didn't require uh, extra ballooning. But uh, now that we see them, we, we tend to, to, to fix them. Now, another question. Oh, and, uh, an interesting question about um, preventing uh, preventive coiling of lumbar artery um, at the initial uh, procedure uh, to prevent endoleak. Um, and that's very interesting that you asked because uh, for the last two years, uh, I've been quite aggressive at uh, doing um, uh, coiling of uh, IMA. Uh, large IMA uh, during uh, EVAR. So in my current practice, uh, when the IMA is four millimeter or above, I tend to put an emplater or a call inside at the beginning of the procedure to avoid those large type 2 endoleaks that uh, we see um, uh, during follow-up. So having said that, I have no data to support what I'm doing. We're currently collecting data. We're going to cross-match those patients with previous patients that we didn't call embolize, and um, hopefully we'll soon have data to support what I'm doing. So I think that... Uh, and there's probably a need to do that if uh, they're very large IMA or very large uh, uh, lumbers. But I'm not sure that uh, you should do that routinely because um, you can. Uh, it's not always that easy. And uh, you can also um, have trash uh, embolize into the lower limbs or the, uh, or the uh, lumbar for IMA by doing that. Now, how will you manage Chakwan endolic in chin in Elix? When <laughs> will you consider calling or stand extension? So that's a, a very a tricky question. So my experience with chimney nix is nil. Uh, I've never used uh, an elix, and I, I don't use chimneys uh, because I'm fortunate to have access to uh, branch and fenestrate in the endograph. So um, I, what I've seen from, from others is, is that uh, with type 1 endolix, they tend to come from above and uh, use a onyx to try and, and seal um, uh, all, all, all the gutters. Um, but again, I have no experience. I'm sorry, I cannot be very accurate in answering the, that question. Uh, OK. So I think we're almost done. There was uh, other questions, or should we conclude? I can't remember. Yeah, there was a question regarding integrating um, uh, ultrasound imaging. Um, we perform a lot of our procedures uh, with ultrasound guiding the puncture and with a ProGlide uh, system. And uh, we've connected the 3D ultrasound, uh, not 3D, sorry, our ultrasound machine uh, 
uh, to our large display monitors. So um, then it's, it's uh, the ergonomy of the whole system is very nice because you actually puncture the groin looking at the large screen uh, just in front. And I think this is something you should do is, is to connect your ultrasound system. And at the end of the procedure, we always check that um, the pro glider system has worked efficiently. And so again, when we get the patient discharged from the hybrid room, we perform the cone beam CT to, to check the technical success and we've performed uh, ultrasound to, uh, to make sure that we have no issues uh, with the ProGlide system. Uh, yeah, the closure device used, uh, this is the, the, the last question, is that the ProGlide, we tend to use two ProGlide when the uh, delivery system is uh, uh, 14 French or uh, larger and one ProGlide uh, if, uh, if it's smaller. There's a learning curve with those devices, but it usually really works well. And we do not perform the 100% uh, 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 ProGlide uh, closure, um, but probably 75 to 80% we tend to select those patients with um, common femoral arteries that are not too diseased and also making sure that the profunda is not too high. Otherwise, we do a small cut down. So I think it's uh, time to, uh, to conclude uh, this webinar. Thank you all uh, for uh, attending. I know you all have a very busy agenda. It was very nice to spend uh, an hour uh, with all of you. I hope uh, that uh, um, the slides and the presentation was clear. Thank you all for all those very interesting questions. And I look forward to seeing you at Charing Cross or, or very soon uh, uh, somewhere uh, in one of those meetings. Bye-bye.